Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the uh, APOC Japan program webinar on um, Japan under Prime Minister Kishida, the LDP presidential election, and the upcoming House of Representatives election. My name is Kyoteru Tsutsui, and I'm the director of the Japan program here at uh, Schoenstein APOC. And it is my great pleasure to welcome two leading experts on Japanese politics to discuss the upcoming lower house election, uh, which will take place on October 31st under the new Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, who just won the election within the ruling Liberal Democratic Party on September 29th, and was subsequently appointed Prime Minister of Japan on October 4th. Um, a lot has happened in Japanese politics in the past couple months. And today we'd like to discuss why Prime Minister Suga had to step down, how Kishida was able to win the LDP presidential election, what his policy agenda might be, how the upcoming lower house election might play out, um, and why nobody expects the opposition parties to defeat the uh, ruling coalition despite all the public discontent about the government's handling of the pandemic. And to answer all these questions, we have two excellent speakers. Uh, our first speaker is Rieko Kage, who is professor of political science at the University of Tokyo. Uh, she has published widely on Japanese politics, focusing on civil society, uh, the new jury system, uh, female representation in politics, attitudes toward migrant labor and other important issues uh, that Japan faces. Our second speaker is Daniel M. Smith, who is a Gerald Curtis Visiting Associate Professor of Modern Japanese Politics and Foreign Policy in the Department of Political Science and also at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. He has published a number of articles uh, and a book on Japanese politics, focusing in particular on electoral politics, parties, and political dynasties in Japan, which will be relevant to our discussion today. Uh, he was a postdoctoral fellow at APOC in 2012-13 and uh, is a familiar face, I think, to many of us here at APOC. So welcome to you both, Rieko and Dan. And um, I'd like to start with a discussion. We'd like to start in two, two segments, basically. And the first segment, deals with a, um, uh, the transition from Prime Minister Suga to Prime Minister Kishida. Uh, Prime Minister Suga had to step down in September, uh, leading to the election of Kishida as the head of LDP. Um, Suga became Prime Minister a year ago when Abe, Prime Minister Abe had to uh, step down due to recurring health issues. And Suga had a design on getting reelected as the head of LDP to execute a number of reforms in Japanese politics, but um, COVID-19 thwarted his plans. So what went wrong for Suga? And despite his short stint, uh, he has actually been credited with a number of accomplishments as well as missteps. So what is his legacy? That's the first segment. Um, in the second segment, we will go um, deeper into the Kishida administration, his policy, his cabinet, and then the uh, prospect for the upcoming House of Representatives elections. Uh, and in the audience, if you have questions, please do submit them in Q and A, and I would uh, I will try to uh, fold them in to our discussion. So, in the first segment, I'd like to have uh, Rieko uh, talk first, and then um, uh, we'll invite uh, Dan to chime in, and then we'll have some discussion. So, Rieko, please take it away. Okay, um, so thanks to Kyo for your kind introduction, and it's a great honor to be here this morning for this wonderful event. Um, so on the, I'll start with the issue of why Suga had to step down and, and what his legacy is in, in the long term. Um, and, and so Suga um, uh, and, and his resignation, in general, um, as we know, um, in Japanese politics, cabinet approval ratings um, in the 20s is, is bad news. Uh, for, for any prime minister, uh, Suga, or, or any of his predecessors. Um, we've seen Aso, uh, Taro Aso, um, Fukuda, and so forth, um, when their cabinet approval ratings plummet into the 20s, usually they have had to step down. And, and this, is, uh, this is true of, of Suga as well. And, and compounding, um, so, so at some point sooner or later, Suga was going to be stepping down um, anyway, as is 
is my sense. And, and in, in addition to, to that, uh, we know uh, that scholars have pointed to sort of the nationalization of Japanese elections, um, particularly since the introduction of the new electoral system in 1996. Um, and with, with the result that electoral results have, um, to a large extent, um, hinged on the popularity of uh, sitting prime ministers um, to a, a significantly larger extent than they have uh, under the previous SNTV electoral system. And, and this has been pointed out by um, Krauss and Nyblade, um, Kenneth McElwain, um, Joan Endo, and, and many other scholars as well. Um, and so that leads to the question of, of what leads prime ministers to be more popular or less popular, or their, their approval ratings to go up and down. And, and one thing that has been pointed to in the, the existing literature uh, by Kenneth McElwain, among others, um, is the importance of stock prices, and that stock prices are important in driving uh, prime ministerial popularity in, in Japan. Um, and Knowing this, uh, prime ministers in Japan, recent prime ministers in Japan, have really tried to stress uh, economic policies. Of course, we know about economics, um, trying to propel the economy um, as much as they can. Uh, what the interesting um, change that has happened um, since the outbreak of, of COVID-19 um, in early 2020 is, is that this dynamic has, has it seems um, shifted a little bit uh, with prime ministerial uh, popularity hinging not so much on stock prices um, in the Japanese context as um, on the uh, COVID-19 uh, case count. And um, so this is, sorry, to, to give you a sense of the prime ministerial popularity ratings, COVID, uh, sorry, um, and um, with Suga's popularity ratings um, gradually um, declining over the months. Uh, the interesting point to note, though, here is, is that they have gone down as the cases have surged um, in early 2020, uh, 2021, um, spring of 2021, and then in um, August 2021. So uh, the red line uh, here refers to the um, popularity uh, approval ratings, uh, the blue line to disapproval ratings. And you can see that um, as the cases have gone up um, in the three waves, uh, its disapproval ratings have also gone up as well here in early uh, 2021, again, um, in around the spring of 2021, and then uh, in this uh, summer as well. So there's some uh, correlation between the cumulative number of cases um, and the uh, his disapproval ratings, uh, which I call from McElwain to Mueller. Um, John Mueller, uh, as you may know, uh, pointed to the effect of, of Vietnam casualty uh, figures correlating with presidential approval ratings. And, and we see something similar to that going on in, in the Japanese context as well. And that's very interesting to, to observe, I think, because um, here are the COVID cases, uh, case count um, across different uh, developed democracies. And we see that Japan's performance, um, if we just look at the, the realm of East Asian democracies, uh, is, is really not great. Um, sorry. Oops. Sorry. Um, so relative to South Korea and Taiwan, Japan's case count has been higher. Uh, relative to other European or North American developed democracies, Japan has done fine. Um, the case count really has not uh, been all that drastically bad. So, so it's interesting to see uh, sort of this correlation between uh, COVID case count and, um, and prime ministerial approval ratings. And, and that's also because in the other developed democracies, or many of them, um, Cabinet approval rating, leadership approval ratings um, have not swung uh, with the COVID uh, count as, as much as they have in Japan. So, so this is Boris Johnson's approval ratings. Um, there are some fluctuations, but over the long run, they've, they've really been quite flat um, over the course uh, in the last 18 months. And, and that's true of Macron as well. Really, uh, the approval and disapproval ratings are, are more or less flat. Um, and, and Merkel as well. Um, in Merkel's case, her approval ratings uh, 
went up uh, markedly around the time that the, the outbreak occurred. And then since then, um, it's again, relatively flat over the months, and especially compared to Suga. So that's really interesting to observe uh, that Suga and, and also Abe's fate as well, um, swung uh, to a considerable extent uh, with the COVID-19 figures and, and to a much larger extent than they have compared to the other developed uh, democracies. Uh, Suga's legacies, um, I can think of several uh, different dimensions of, of legacies, both positive and negative. And again, these are, are in terms of long term legacies, I think we, we will need to wait for a few years until um, his, his real legacies really pan out and what we can make of them. Uh, but I can think of um, five issues in which he may have left a, a mark, despite um, the fact that, of course, he, he only remained in power for uh, just over a year. Uh, his impact on academics and, free, uh, and freedom of, um, of academic pursuit. Uh, of course, we know about his uh, intervention into the Science Council of Japan uh, membership election. Um, the Science Council of Japan had put up a number of candidates to be members of the Science Council of Japan, uh, which is, of course, the uh, great um, uh, it, which is something that uh, no sitting prime minister had, had previously uh, done uh, before. Um, and uh, of course, we, it remains to be seen if, if Kishida will continue to do this. He did just announce that um, he will not be approving uh, the members uh, for, that who were turned down last year um, into uh, the new membership this year. Uh, but will he also continue to turn down uh, new members that have been recommended for the Science Council, we will uh, have to wait and see. Uh, legacy, uh, as far as Olympic Games go, uh, I think the uh, Suga's uh, pushing the Olympic Games uh, and instead of postponing or canceling the Olympic Games uh, did have an effect on how uh, the public in Japan will view a future uh, hosting of, of similar games and um, it, it will be very, very difficult for Japan to host Olympic Games um, summer or winter uh, in the future. Um, so that those two I can think of as, as possible negative legacies of the Suga uh, cabinet. Uh, on the positive front, uh, Suga did uh, implement and introduce um, a number of, of, of new policy initiatives um, and in terms of energy policy. Um, he introduced uh, quite a uh, dramatic break from existing policies in terms of, of carbon neutral uh, sustainability front, um, also in expanding insurance coverage for infertility treatment. Um, until now, and insurance coverage was not available for, for any kinds of uh, infertility treatment. Families were being forced to uh, pay for this out of their own uh, pockets. So uh, this is uh, great news for a lot of families. Um, this will be going into effect next spring, I believe. Um, and so this could leave uh, an impact on, on the very uh, severely uh, diminished uh, fertility rates in Japan. Uh, vaccinations um, is another area in which uh, Suga has made significant progress. Of course, Japan was quite slow getting off the ground uh, in terms of uh, COVID, uh, the COVID-19 vaccinations, but once it did get off the ground in the spring, it has made significant progress. Um, this was as of uh, last night. I, I picked up the latest figures, um, and Japan has been 67% fully vaccinated, um, 76% um, once vaccinated, uh, which are really not bad for, for a country that really only started vaccinating in back in the spring. And you see the numbers here, uh, Japan really didn't um, start vaccinating until April, May of 2021, uh, quite a bit behind the other developed democracies. But once it did get going, um, the rates have picked up and it is still uh, vaccinating at fairly high rates. Um, so the 76% figure that you saw is, is going to be higher um, over the next few months as well. Um, so um, this, in the long term, this could, uh, again, uh, be seen as uh, another significant uh, mark that Suga has left um, as well. So I think I will stop there and, um, and let Dan um, pick up. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ryoko. Uh, on the question of Suga's legacy um, and, and why he had to step down, 
the only thing I would add to Dieko's otherwise um, amazing and thorough account is the creation of the digital agency under Zug administration that came into um, being on September 1st and was uh, sort of a long, um, well, part of a, a long push under the Zug administration, especially under um, a former minister, uh, Taro Kono, who was one of the, the contestants for the leadership election, to try to um, modernize and digitize much of the, um, uh, do away with all the paperwork uh, in government administration. So that might be another positive legacy that Suga is allowed to uh, claim for his short time in office. Why else did he have to step down? Uh, something that characterized Suga and set him apart from his predecessors was that he didn't have a strong factional support base. He was one of the first prime ministers, um, well, first prime minister since Mori, who wasn't also related to former cabinet ministers and part of a, of a political dynasty um, and didn't control uh, a faction unlike many other former uh, prime ministers. And so at least from my perspective, I got the sense that when his support rate started uh, falling uh, with the, the pandemic, uh, the, the sharks were sort of circling uh, the water is just waiting for a chance for their for their turn. And of course, in the 2020 presidential election, um, it, which was precipitated by Abe's sudden decision to step down in August 2020, the party opted for a kind of closed internal selection process, not an open process with with party rank and file voting as in the 2021 presidential contest. Uh, and Suga's main rival in that contest was Kishida. So Kishida has come back sort of with a vengeance to to claim uh power from suga after suga stepped down so you see some you know, maybe there was some kind of antsiness or itching for uh the opportunity to to claim power from suga uh, uh when when it looked like he was going to be weaker going into the election um but that's all i would add to to, to dieko's really amazing and thorough uh summary of the the first question on our agenda great yeah thank you um and i agree with Dan, that Rieko's summary was excellent. Um, I would add just one more thing um, to Suga's accomplishments, uh, lowering the uh, uh, cell phone bill. Um, he's credited with lowering the bill by what, 40% or something? That, um, you know, that's um, not insignificant. Uh, and also the establishment of digital agency was done in a kind of miraculous speed by the standards of Japanese bureaucracy. Uh, the, the legacy of Olympics, I um, Rieko characterized as a negative. I think, I think the jury is still out on that. Um, some people actually see that as a positive uh, um, outcome for not producing um, sort of uh, and not, not making it a, a super spreader event and performing the sort of the duties to the international community, at least of athletes. Um, and so why he had to step down? Um, I'm wondering what you think of this scenario. If um, he had a bad day in September, in my view, Suga did. Uh, after Kishida announced that he would run to challenge uh, his position in the LDP presidential election, Kishida also announced that he would basically let Nikai, the Secretary General, go. And Suga countered by announcing that he will let Nikai go. And then things, the whole thing really collapsed after that because he couldn't find anybody to take over Nikai's position because other factions kind of withdrew. Abe's support, Aso's support kind of disappeared. If he hadn't done that, if he had kind of stayed the course, um, at that point, COVID numbers were still relatively high. But a few weeks after that, numbers, new cases declined really, really significantly the vaccine rates went up quite a bit. So had he stayed the course, stick, stuck with uh, Nikai, and then ran the, uh, the presidential, LDP presidential election, um, and you know he could have uh, uh, sent the message that uh, we did it in terms of COVID. We, uh, vaccination rates are up, the new cases are low. By late September, things look quite, quite good. Um, so what do you think? would have happened if he actually had, this is the hypothetical, it's kind of meaningless, but it's an interesting point to discuss. So I wonder what your take might be, uh, either of you. Yeah, um, 
I, I actually think that um, Suga, to, to some extent, was was unlucky. And um, if if all of this had happened um, one month after it, they had um, he surely would have been able to to would have been able to stay in power, and um, he he would have been the, the sitting prime minister going into the elections. Yes, definitely. I, I agree, although I think that in, in some ways, given how um, tainted his reputation was at, at the time, uh, it, it would have been unlikely for him to have recovered as much as uh, Kishida may be able to recover as somebody who's new and has this uh, change in the coronavirus uh, situation. But even with that, the, the change. It's notable that Kishida's support rate uh, as the new prime minister is, is about 40%, uh, according to some polls, which is the lowest support rate for a new cabinet, a uh, new prime minister since Aso in 2008. Uh, and it's much lower than um, than Suga's was when he first started, uh, which I think in the, in the slide that Rieko showed was around 60% uh, support when he first came in. Uh, so even though Kishida was new and had this improvement in the coronavirus situation, he didn't seem to be getting much credit from the, the population in terms of um, uh, the success of his predecessor's uh, coronavirus policies. Yeah, and much has been said about his communication skills being the uh, main factor that uh, doomed his administration. Um, I'm also wondering about, so Dan mentioned the faction, right? He's not, he doesn't belong to any major factions. Um, and when things are tough, uh, factions actually can still serve to um, support uh, the prime minister and he, he didn't have that support, Suga didn't. Um, also, he is not, this is Dan's topic, he is not from a, a political dynasty, one of the right, few LDP politicians to become prime minister in recent years who is not a uh, part of the uh, political family dynasty. Um, what do you make of that, Dan? It, will we see, th does it have anything to do with uh, Suga's demise that he didn't have that uh, um, dynasty background in addition to not having faction support? And will we see another um, non Nisei Sansei, non dynasty politician become prime minister under LDP government? Yeah, that's hard to say. So. Um... Uh, on the one hand, if we if we look at the the LDP presidential election that followed, um, Kishida, who won the election as a third generation politician, his father and grandfather were both in politics before him. He's also actually related to um, former Prime Minister Miyazawa uh, Kichi as well. Uh, his main um, rival in the election was Kono Otaro, who of course is also uh, uh, from a political dynasty, a uh, very prominent one. Uh, and uh, another uh, contender, Noda Seiko, is from a political family as well. Um, but Takeichi Sanae is not from a political dynasty, and she did fairly well coming in third in the, um, in the first round of votes and had the support of, of Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Abe. Um, and so it could be possible for another uh, non-dynastic politician like um, Takeichi Sanae to, to excel in the party. The real shift that uh, it will happen will take a few more years. So I've, I've noticed that um, not only in the Kishida cabinet, but in recent cabinets, almost 60% of cabinet ministers come from political dynasties. So in the Kishida cabinet, it's 57% either are the successors of former politicians or have preceded uh, their family members into local office or national office. Um, and that's partly because of seniority. Um, the people who are coming into power now Many of them were elected like Kishida in the early 1990s, when it was still quite common for the LDP to recruit um, new candidates from among the, the offspring of former um, incumbents. Uh, but since the 1990s, especially with the electoral system reform, the number of new dynastic politicians has declined. And so if you look at the junior ranks of the LDP, there are far fewer dynasties than in the senior ranks. And so there, sh there, there should be uh, somewhat of a generational shift in the coming uh, uh, years where there'll be fewer and fewer uh, dynastic members. Those who are there, people like Koizumi Shinjiro and, and Fukuda Tatsuo will still have an advantage in getting promoted. Right, yeah, I think I would add Hagi Uda to the list of non-dynasty politicians who might have a good shot at becoming prime minister. Um, 
Priyanka, you stopped right before your slide on the uh, LDP presidential election uh, with the vote share and all of that. Um, and there's a question from the audience, from Eve, uh, Eve Kibargen, about uh, what price the LDP might pay for not picking Taro Kono as its president. Uh, Taro Kono was uh, widely popular among the public, but the uh, LDP presidential election is not public vote, it, it's right party members who vote, wh whose composition is, what is it? The average age is supposedly close to 70 or something. So, so it doesn't reflect the young people's uh, minds <laughs> so well. Um, so would in the, in the general election, in the lower house election, do you think um, LDP might pay a price for not picking the wildly popular Taro Kono who actually had a coalition with Ishiba and Koizumi, this, this Koishikawa unit, uh, right? I mean, they have majority of support in the public uh, among the LDP presidential candidates. So, Rieko? Right. Um, I, I agree that um, the LDP probably will pay a price um, for uh, not picking Kono, although um, I would be hesitant to predict an opposition victory in the upcoming elections. So, um, so, so on, the, on the one hand, there, there is that, but um, it's certainly I think will have done better um, if if they had picked Kono. Um, however, uh, one reason why um, Kono ended up um, not being uh, elected, I think, is well, there are several. But um, um, the LDP's uh, approval ratings were beginning to recover somewhat by the time of the uh, LDP presidential elections, and I think that put. The minds of, of many LDP NPs um, at ease that it, it sort of removed the sense of urgency and, and crisis I think that had been in their minds um, a month earlier um, with with the effect that um, rather than going with um, the candidate that was the most popular among the public um, they were more willing to to go with uh, the kinds of uh, candidates that the faction leaders uh, were, were pushing for so I think that was an important um, sort of backdrop going into um, the presidential elections. Great, thanks. Um, There's some, some questions about um, Kishida's policies and so on. And um, I think we wanna turn to the second segment where uh, we'll talk about Kishida cabinet, its composition, Kishida's policies, and uh, how uh, Kishida and the LDP might fare um, in the upcoming lower house election. And for that, I'd like to turn it over to Dan for a presentation. Okay, can uh, you see my, my slides now? Yes. Let's see. I'll just do a full screen. Okay, so um, thank you, uh, Keo, and I should um, I should have said thank you very much to uh, Keo and and A Park for inviting uh, Ryoko, Ryoko and me to um, take part in this webinar. It's um, it's really great to uh, discuss the exciting uh, changes that are happening in Japan and heading into the election. What we might expect. Uh, so I want to um, mention a few things about the uh, timeline uh, that we can expect. Um, moving forward, uh, as well as you know, where we are currently uh, uh, with respect to the change in LEP um, uh, president and prime minister, and then uh, what's uh, coming up in the, in the near future. So uh, as Ryoko already mentioned, Kishida won the LDP presidential contest on September 29th and became um, then prime minister on October 4th. Uh, on October 14th, dissolved the House of Representatives. And tonight actually will be the start of the campaign uh, tomorrow uh, in the United States. Uh, it's a 12-day campaign, a short campaign, and halfway through we'll have something of a bellwether uh, because there's going to be special elections this Sunday for two House of Councilors uh, seats in Yamaguchi and Shizuoka. The Yamaguchi race is almost certainly going to be won by the LDP candidate, um, but the Shizuoka race is looking uh, less certain, so it may be a, a test for uh, whether the opposition will be able to um, win some votes uh, and, and pose a threat to the LDP's dominance. And election day will be Halloween, October 31st. So um, I just want to uh, we'll move this out of the way. Um, 
discuss the Kishida cabinet. So when Kishida won the LDP presidential election, uh, he made a big show of uh, uh, advertising an opportunity to regenerate the LDP, a renewal for the LDP. Uh, and as, um, as we've already hinted, uh, 13 of his cabinet appointees were new uh, cabinet uh, appointees, never uh, having previously been appointed to cabinet. This is after eight to nine years of stability in the Abe and then Suga administrations, where, for example, fi uh, Finance Minister uh, Aso Taro had been in that position for nine years. Uh, so on the one hand, it looked like there was going to be this new rejuvenation within uh, the leadership. On the other hand, uh, many have pointed out that, that there's some kind of factional balancing going on within Kishida's cabinet, and that many of the appointees are from familiar family dynasties. So I mentioned 57% come from political families. That includes the new uh, finance minister, uh, Suzuki Shunichi, who is actually Aso's half-brother uh, and the son of former prime minister, uh, Suzuki Zenko. Um, Kishida's support rate uh, is fairly low, about 40% for a new uh, prime minister. That's much better than the low that Suga had of 26% before he decided to step down, uh, but it's still not great for him and his party heading into the election. Uh, he's tried to uh, uh, signal a break with the uh, nine years of Abe Suga administrations, uh, and particularly the economic policies, Abenomics uh, of the, the Abe years, uh, by pledging to introduce a new capitalism uh, as the LDP's economic policies. So increasing spending to um, uh, thicken the middle class uh, in Japan. Uh, but it's also notable that the LDP policy, policy manifesto uh, doesn't feature many of the policies that Kishida campaigned on in the LDP presidential election. Instead, it's been pointed out that many of the policies uh, touted by his rival in the race, uh, Takeichi Sanai, have been inserted into the manifesto. Um, let me just, Kio, can I talk about the, the election and opposition or should we um, stick to the, to the new cabinet? Yes, please, now? please go okay. ahead, go ahead, Dan, talk about that. So what does this mean for Kishida and his party heading into the election? The biggest uh, concern for the LDP and their continued dominance is that the opposition parties have gotten serious about coordination. So in more than 200 of the 280 single seat districts, I think last I, I heard it was about 212, uh, districts, the opposition is fielding a single candidate and supporting that single uh, candidate. Um, and they're downplaying policy disagreements. So a few weeks ago, prior to the start of the campaign, uh, the four parties led by the people you see here, so that's the Shaminto, or the Social Democratic Party, the Japanese Communist Party, the Constitutional Democratic Party, and the Beiwa Shinsengumi, uh, decided on a series of uh, uh, policy areas on which they could agree, uh, leaving off uh, areas where they have uh, disagreements and trying not to focus on those uh, areas. Um, it's controversial for, for some voters that the CDP, the main opposition party, is cooperating with the JCP, which has um, usually been excluded from coordination agreements and has not participated in stand down uh, arrangements. And the LDP uh, heavyweights like Abe, uh, Kono, uh, and uh, Amari Akira, who's the Secretary General, have tried to paint the election as sort of a communism versus democracy uh, 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 problem, uh, which the, the LDP uh, has so far not been able to, uh, to land serious blows with, uh, because the JCP has said that it will not participate in government even if the opposition were to win. Uh, and the policies on which the, the parties are, are campaigning have nothing to do with overthrowing uh, capitalism or, or democracy and introducing communism. So we'll see whether that, uh, that scare tactic works in the election or not. The most important thing to keep in mind is that the coordination may uh, help the opposition to uh, avoid handing the LDP and Komeito easy wins in districts where their candidates enjoy less than a majority of support. So this comes from uh, previous work I've done with um, Stephen Reed and Ethan Shiner and Mike Fees for the 2012, 2014, and 2017 uh, elections in the um, Japan Decides volumes. And I'm now currently editing with Robert Pekinen and Stephen Reed, uh, Japan Decides 2021. Uh, and this is sort of one of the features of opposition coordination that I'm um, uh, keen to look for in the upcoming uh, election. So in 2017, to just take as an example, the LDP and Komeito won 223 of 289 uh, seats. 
but in uh, a good portion of those seats, their candidate had less than a majority of support, only a plurality of support. If we assume uh, that the votes that had gone to disparate opposition parties would uh, sum up to um, and be uh, given to um, a single candidate if those um, opposition parties coordinated around a single candidate, which is a, a, a fairly large assumption, but just assuming that those, the vote shares would go to a single opposition candidate, uh, then if we had unification of the DPJ, or the CDP, and other third force parties, uh, the LDP would have lost 22 of those seats, so they received a bonus of 22 seats in 2017. Uh, which is not a huge amount, and it would not have swung the uh, election outcome in, in 2017 to result in the LDP uh, losing its majority. But had the JCP also been in, involved in coordination, which is the, the bottom uh, row in this table, uh, then 77 seats, as many as 77 seats could have been taken away from uh, the LDP Cometo coalition, uh, which would have been very close to reversing uh, the majority. So given that the JCP is now cooperating uh, with the opposition and has um, uh, fielded, a, and the, the opposition has fielded a single candidate in, in uh, more than 200 of the 289 seats, uh, it's likely that there's a greater threat to the LDP uh, losing some of these plurality um, uh, races uh, in 2021 than there was in any of the previous three elections. Let's see. Uh, Uh, Keo, can we talk about policy now, or should I wait for, for, for the next uh, question? Oh, please go ahead. Let's okay. finish it off, and then we can come back. So uh, just to finish off this section, um, another difference in 2021 uh, compared to previous elections is the policy uh, debates. So in previous elections um, in 2014 and 2017, for example, uh, economic policy was front and center. Uh, with Abenomics as the, um, the rallying cry for uh, the LDP. The coronavirus has upended that narrative to, to a large extent. So a, a key issue is the coronavirus policy. Uh, some of that's going to be retrospective. Uh, has the LDP done a good job handling uh, the virus? On future-oriented policies, most of the parties are in general in agreement about more testing and uh, rolling out vaccine. Uh, continue to roll out the vaccine. The CDP stands out as uh, somewhat different in calling for continued 10-day uh, quarantine for any visitors to Japan. On economic policy, all of the parties are promoting various social benefits and social spending. Uh, the opposition parties, the uh, CDP, the JCP, and the uh, SDP want to lower the consumption tax uh, back to 5%. On national security, the big difference is that the LDP uh, is uh, proposing increased defense spending up to 2% of GDP, which has previously been uh, capped at 1%. And, and all of the parties, except for the JCP, uh, support the US-Japan alliance. Nuclear energy is another area where there's a potential uh, cleavage within the electorate. Most parties want more renewable energy, but the LDP um, is, is more in favor of restarting uh, nuclear power plants than other parties. The JCP wants zero nuclear energy in the future. And finally, in my view, the most interesting new dynamic of the policy debates for this election is around social diversity. So all of the parties have put forward uh, policies that relate to um, promoting understanding of LGBT uh, citizens and, and gender identity. Um, all of the parties, apart from the LDP, support elective separate surnames. So um, men and women who get married can uh, choose to keep their, their family names. Uh, the LDP is an exception here. Uh, and some of the parties are also supporting same-sex marriage in their manifestos. So this is, a, I think, a key shift from past elections where social issues have become uh, a major part of the campaign uh, narrative. In terms of key takes, takeaways, the LDP won landslides in 2012, 2014, and 2017, uh, in part thanks to the low popularity of the opposition, relatively high popularity of Prime Minister Abe as the leader of the LDP, opposition fragmentation in single seat districts and low voter turnout. This time around, what I have my eye on for, for the election is whether the popularity of the opposition will improve. It doesn't seem that there's been much change, but they are offering a clear al alternative policy vision. Prime Minister Kishida is less popular than Abe, which may be a factor in, in the outcome. There's unity in most single seat districts, uh, which 
could uh, deny the LDP some easy races, particularly in urban districts in Tokyo and Saitama that they've been winning with just a plurality of the vote, not a majority. Uh, and the big question mark will be around low turnout. The opposition tends to do poorly when turnout is low. Conversely, the LDP and Komeito, which have better organized vote, uh, do well. Uh, and the last time turnout was higher than uh, around 55% uh, uh, was the 2009 election when the DPJ won control of the government. That was also the last time that the opposition seriously coordinated candidates. Uh, so if turnout were to increase uh, this year, then there may be a chance for the opposition to claw back um, some power from the LDP and Komeito, which has a two-thirds majority now. Um, whether it's enough to reverse the majority entirely, I'm, I'm less um, optimistic about that. Um, but the public has signaled in public opinion polls that they would like to see some improvement in the opposition seat shares. Uh, and about 52% of voters indicated that they're absolutely likely to turn out to vote. Uh, so that's the, the possibly the key determinant of, of how the election will shake out uh, for the opposition uh, on October 31st. I'll uh, end there. Thank you. That was wonderful, Anne. Um, I want to come back to the election prospects, but um, there are a number of questions about policy issues, um, especially in terms of uh, continuity between Abe and Suga on the one hand, and Kishida now being the prime minister. Um, Mindy Kotler points out that uh, the public, majority of public seems to want a change from um, Abe and Suga's policies, um, but is it likely? And Tom Finger asks um, um, about, um, yeah, wh whether the LDP will remain more or less the same in terms of policy commitments and um, would things have been different if somebody else, like Kono's uh, platform, uh, Takaichi's, know that the other candidates uh, for the presidential election, um, would things have been different? And what does it mean that Kishida won uh, in terms of uh, uh, policy priorities going forward for the LDP? Um, do you wanna re-echo? Maybe you wanna take that on first or Dan? Okay, sure. Um, in, in terms of, of policies, yes. I, um, if, if Kono had taken over, uh, I, I think he would have been pushing a, a much more uh, drastic uh, break from the Abe Suga policies. And, and so in that sense, Kishida was sort of the, the, the safe choice. Um, and, and largely the LDP, I think, has, has chosen not to uh, make any changes. Um, and uh, that there is, of course, discussion of, of much more emphasis on, on fiscal policies uh, with the Kishida cabinet, uh, whereas the, the Abe Suga uh, cabinets had relied much more on, on, on monetary policies. Um, but th there is some uh, question as to whether Kishida will actually be uh, implementing what he has, has promised. Of course, we have the election coming up, so there is a lot of somewhat of a bidding war going on at the moment, it seems, with the LDP and the opposition parties sort of trying to, to in a way, bribe the, the voters into voting for them uh, by offering all sorts of fiscal um, benefits. It's not entirely clear if, if any of these parties, if they're elected, will actually um, follow through once the election is over. Uh, the Ministry of Finance has already made noises that they are not in favor of any of this. Uh, and so, so um, and I think the voters will take that into account when they um, show, up into the, show up at the polls. Um, as for policies, um, I, I also just like to point um, uh, to to a, a really excellent paper that that Dan wrote um, with with Yusaku Horiuchi and, and Tepe Yamamoto, which uh, showed that the general public in in Japan really uh, favors has has favored um, the the kinds of policies that the opposition has pushed for uh, much more than um, the kinds of policies that the LDP has has favored, and that that really the, the electoral difference has hinged more on things like uh, that, that Dan pointed to, uh, like uh, the failure of the opposition to coordinate, um, voter turnout. Um, and, and I would also point to um, one, one other factor, which I think is um, possibly could play into this election, which is uh, I think the LDP has been able to, to sort of cast this image of, of competence in, in past elections, you know, they may not have the the kinds of policies that that the general public may may favor the most, but um, they are the responsible party. They are uh, the competent party, and 
and you know when when 311 happened you know the, the dpj was in power and and they botched the handling of that disaster uh, horribly whereas if, if they had been in power uh, we you know the ldp would have been able to handle it much more competently and and i think that sort of aura of, of competence has, has to some degree been been shattered uh, by their handling of, of covid 19 and um and, and so the the opposition continues to be um, unpopular um, and they don't particularly have um, this image of competence, but the LDP now it seems has also become um, unpopular and and now their uh, their their image of competence is is uh, has been tarnished. So so in that sense, uh, in a way it's become the competition of the uh, between the the ugly. <laughs> and um, I think that's that's sort of the interesting um, aspect of this upcoming elections. Dan, anything to add? Yeah, I would just add, I see um, a comment from Eve Tabergian about Kishida kind of taking on the aura of uh, former Prime Minister Ikeda. I think they, 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 um, there's sort of a direct factional history route from Ikeda to Kishida. And it, it, it dovetails with um, similarities with Abe and uh, his grandfather Kishi. Uh, and getting back to the idea, there's these dynasties in, in, in cabinet. Uh, oftentimes, they're kind of continuing a long story of at least policy framing, if not policy issues. Uh, even Hatoyama Yukio, the first DPJ prime minister, made a big deal of, of UI or fraternity, which happened to be his grandfather's favorite uh, catchphrase, Hatoyama Ichiro. And so you do see this kind of continuity in, in policy across generations, which may be an advantage for dynastic politicians like, like Kishida. I think the, the main difference is if the LDP president uh, presidential race had gone to Kono, Kono would have had an easier time selling the idea that he was a reformist who was changing the, the LDP. I think you see Kishida trying to do that with the, the catchphrases like new capitalism, trying to break with, mm -hmm. with the um, policies of, of Abe and Suga. Um, but it's, it's just less um, personally credible for Kishida, even if the, the LDP has this uh, party credibility valence uh, advantage over uh, over other parties. Uh, so, so we'll see whether voters buy it or not. Um, but there's certainly been an effort to uh, buy Kishida because he was viewed as the kind of establishment insider pick uh, to sell himself as a break with the past nine years. Yeah, and, and during the presidential campaign, uh, LVP presidential campaign, Kishida at least uh, floated some new ideas like the new capitalism. Um, but, and then he talked about um, increasing the capital gains tax, but then as he got elected, the stock market responded negatively, it went down, or well, what about eight consecutive days or something. And then he re basically rescinded that idea by now, uh, as far as I can tell. So it, it seems like this is a recurring pattern when Kishida proposes, he had a lot of other proposals, right, during the campaign, but now it doesn't seem like he's any different from um, um, Abe or Suga, especially Abe. I mean, Suga was, had a more of a reform, reformist mind. Um, so it's kind of hard to see exactly what is unique about the Kishida administration. Um, is it really just a sort of a steady hand that would manage the government for maybe a year or two? Or, or does he have uh, the prospect of lasting much longer than that? What, what, what's your take on Kishida's longevity as prime minister? And what, what does he have to do? It is an interesting question. So Abe gave Japan eight years of stability. And with Suga being out of office after a year, um, the, the question is, will Japan go back to this rotating prime minister's uh, you know, situation? And so far, particularly, particularly if, if the LDP loses uh, a considerable number of seats under Kishida, even if Kishida stays in office, um, I don't think it would uh, bode well for his long-term prospects as leader of the party, um, especially when there are, there are plenty of younger um, uh, candidates waiting in the wings to replace him, if not Taro Kono, uh, if not Sanai um, Takaichi, uh, then the newer generation like uh, Shinjiro Koizumi or, uh, or even Fukuda Tatsuo eventually, Tatsuo Fukuda. But I'd, I'd like to hear what, what uh, Rieko thinks. 
Yeah, um, so in, in terms of um, Kishida's longevity and, and, and so forth, um, I think the, the what stands out in my mind is when we, when we look at this, the composition of the new cabinet, um, and, and Dan pointed to um, there being 13 new cabinet members out of, of 20. Um, so this is a fairly inexperienced um, group of uh, politicians. And, and uh, what stands out in my mind is, uh, so there are three uh, cabinet ministers who are, who are overseeing uh, COVID-19. There's the health minister, the vaccine minister, and, and the economic uh, regeneration minister. Uh, and and all of the, for all of those uh, three positions, um, Kishida appointed a, uh, a, a first time minister uh, with very little previous um, administerial experience. And um, as, as um, as I mentioned earlier, the COVID-19 case count does seem to be very important in, in shaping cabinet popularity. And the fact that he appointed, that Kishida appointed uh, three new uh, cabinet members to those three key positions uh, seems to show that he, he doesn't quite realize the importance of, of those three positions. So, so I, would, I would be a little bit um, concerned about that in, in terms of even if, it, even if he does get through this um, elections. Yeah, everybody's worried about the sixth wave uh, of COVID-19 in Japan, and that that could uh, really topple uh, his government. Um, there's another question about internal uh, domestic policy from Robert Feldman about um, the credibility of Kishida, Kishida's claim that um, he would uh, commit to growth strategy, and especially through commitment to science and technology, and he talked about investment in university research and so on. Um, the question is whether that's new or credible. Um, maybe Rieko, from the standpoint of being in the university in Japan, um, does that uh, Jucho and commitment, does that make a difference? The endowment? <laughs> um, I, I, I'd love to see it if it really happens. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, I mean, again, the, the Ministry of Finance um, has, has been making noises that this is not something that they this big spending is, is, is not really um, something that they want to see. I, I, I would be a little bit skeptical to um, believe all of the spending promises that are coming out right now. Um, in, in terms of um, sort of going back to your question of, of what really makes Kishida stand out vis-a-vis -vis Suga um, Abe, um, however, is, is in my mind, it's is not so much in terms of policy substance as, as much as in, in the approach and, um, of course, Abe, Abe and Suga sort of developed a reputation for, for not answering um, journalists' questions or, or answering uh, them in a way that didn't answer the questions and, and so forth. And, and Kishida, in my mind, seems to be um, more of a sort of a dialogue person, uh, trying to engage the press, engage the public. Um, I, I've noticed that the press has been um, somewhat surprised that Kishida has, has invited um, journalists to certain events that um, he's been attending and so forth. So, so this sense of engaging in dialogue, um, sort of providing more of an explanation for what, what he wants to do, um, perhaps might be a, a something that, that sets Kishida apart uh, from his predecessors. Although I, I'd also be interested to see what, the, I, I see some members of the press in the audience today, so I'd be curious to see what um, they think about that. Yeah, I think there is a sense that he is genuinely a nice person and uh, he emphasizes his kiku chikara, that capacity to listen to other people. And that actually that might might not be trivial, right, in this day of uh, COVID crisis and, and, and all that other issues. Um, I want to talk about foreign policy a little bit, but, um, you know, there's a lot of continuity. The foreign minister and defense minister stayed. Um, Kishida floated this point about um, increasing the defense spending to uh, uh, above 2% uh, of GDP, potentially. Uh, it, it didn't seem to create any right, uh, news flash in Japan, um, although that would be a significant change, I think. Um, and people, there's an anonymous uh, question in the, from the audience about whether Japan is going to look more toward China or more to, to stay with the US, uh, continue to look at the US more. Uh, it seems to me like there's a lot of continuity in foreign policy, but do you have any changes? Uh, do you foresee any changes coming in that regard? Either of you? From my impression, yeah. just from watching the, the, um, the start of the campaign, uh, so a lot can happen. In, in 2017, just before the uh, election campaign kicked off, North Korea shot missiles into the into the sea 
uh, and Abe reframed the election as a kind of national security credibility, ability to handle a crisis election. Um, the similar missile um, uh, firings a few, uh, several weeks ago, a couple months ago, didn't seem to have the same effect um, uh, this time around. And it doesn't seem like national security uh, issues are front and center on the on the agenda for the campaign. So coronavirus policy, economic recovery, uh, and as I mentioned, this new element of, of, of um, uh, social diversity uh, seem to be more uh, important uh, in, in discussions. There, there's less um, disagreement uh, among the parties. Uh, and issues like um, whether uh, Japan would, um, uh, as part of the US-Japan Security Alliance, uh, support uh, some kind of military defense of Taiwan in the event of um, in invasion uh, that were raised in the in the context of the LDP presidential election haven't really played into the campaign as of yet. Um, but I, I think that's it's too early to uh, to say. Okay, so um, the final question, final point, um, the upcoming election. Um, so, you know, COVID-19 has basically toppled Abe and Suga, the two prime ministers, but uh, throughout all of that, the uh, approval rating for LDP, the party, hasn't really declined that much. And the uh, uh, support for opposition parties like the Constitutional Democratic Party hasn't increased much at all. Um, so it's, it's kind of peculiar looking at it from outside that uh, there's a great deal of public discontent about the handling of the pandemic, and yet, LDP or the coalition government is uh, almost assured of a, of a victory, right? They're not gonna lose. Uh, nobody thinks that they're, they're going to lose. We don't know yet, but nobody thinks that they will lose power. Um, so why is that? And, and uh, I think a healthy democracy, we have to have change of power. Um, what does Japan, what should happen in Japan to enable that? Um, it's a difficult question, but if you could uh, share your insight on that. Maybe starting with Rico. Right. Um, so when when the DPJ won power in, in 2009, um, their, their party approval rating wasn't particularly high either. Uh, so it seems to me that party approval ratings are, are not a great measure of um, their, their um, or not a great indicator of, of, of how well they're likely to do in, in upcoming uh, elections. And, and, and that said, it, it is true that their approval rating is, is very high, uh, sorry, very low. And, um, and, and why is that? I mean, to some extent, um, in my mind, there, there's not much that they can do about that um, while they're out of power, be pre precisely because they are out of power. Um, and again, um, I think they're, they've, really suffered from um, their reputation as, as, um, as, as being the, the party that, that lacks competence. And, and I think there's only one of two ways around that is, is, is either the LDP also um, loses their, their reputation for competence or, and or they are somehow able to get into power and, and, and develop more of a uh, but which which go together, and um, I, I do think that the fact that the LDP um, lost their uh, somewhat their reputation for for competence uh, over the last eighteen months um, does help um, the uh, the opposition. And again, I wouldn't put my money on on the opposition winning this upcoming elections, but I, I think they will do uh, be doing much better certainly than in the last couple of elections. Um, there, there is, it really is a catch-22 kind of situation, and I, I, I um, and so it really uh, has, uh, depends, I think, to a large extent on, on how the LDP um, bears, I think, which, uh, which really puts them in a sort of a helpless kind of situation. <laughs> ben? Yeah, I would just, I would agree with Bieko and point out that the, Although the LDP is the most popular party, its support has is, is really been capped at about 30% of the electorate, and that's pretty stable. Uh, that hasn't changed much um, over the past uh, decade uh, or so. And with that 30%, combined with the support of, of Cometo voters, the LDP is able to translate um, th that support into, into majorities. 
Um, and the biggest uh, group of voters in Japan are, are floating voters or you know, those who support no party. So even if the largest opposition party, the CDP only has, I think in, in public opinion polls, it usually gets around five, four or 5% support. Um, and the last poll I saw on vote intentions for the proportional representation vote in the upcoming election, it was about 10%. Um, that's for people who have already committed and decided that they're gonna support the, the, the CDP. And as Diego pointed out, when the DPJ was able to arrest control of government from the LDP in 2009, going into that election, the DPJ only had about 12% support in the, in the electorate. It wasn't a particularly um, a popular uh, party, but it had coordination among the other opposition parties, and it was the receptacle for voter dissatisfaction with the LDP. And so if voters are dissatisfied with the LDP's handling of the coronavirus or unimpressed by the Kishida uh, cabinet, uh, and they decide to turn out, that 40% of voters who are sort of undecided and floating are going to be the key to determining the outcome of the election. If they decide to break for the CDP and the opposition, then um, the, the opposition could win uh, many more seats. Uh, although I agree with, with Rieko that I wouldn't yet bet on a change in uh, alternation in power. Great, thank you. Uh, we have to close now. Maybe you, um, both of you, maybe you would like to make a prediction on the number of seats that the coalition, <laughs> the ruling coalition might win to 40 something. <laughs> This, this video is going to be public, so I'm not yes. going to make any predictions <laughs> in terms of numbers. Okay. Um, we'll see how it goes. Uh, and, and thank you for joining us. Uh, the audience, sorry if I couldn't uh, take up your questions, um, but thank you for submitting all these wonderful questions. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, thank you to the two excellent speakers, um, Dan and Rieko. Um, I hope to have you back again to discuss more about Japanese politics in the coming months and years. So thank you. <laughs>